one of the reasons why we're seeing an issue so much with the dynamics of narcissism is that we value some things and we might even get in the relationship because we value these certain things. And to question your own value, what is it that you actually really value? Is it somebody's achievement and charisma and power and production of material? Or is it actually we value connection and we value deep trust that's between us, not trust that you're not going to have an affair on me. That's not trust. Trust is that you're going to see me and be sensitive. So when you get more clear, get clear on what you value. And you might have to lose what it is you were attracted to. Because when you want to value that person, and even in the relationship with a narcissist, when they're pulling you for achievement, when they're pulling you for the compliments, you actually can see that more deeply. And don't don't buy into that because they believe that's their their sense of Um, value to you. So find what you actually value in them because we aren't all narcissistic, even if you have narcissistic defenses and don't get called into you're so great in the world. And an example would be, let's say they failed at 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 a performance review. You might be tempted to get pulled in, but your next review be fine. They're stupid. And to, to push it over instead of, you know what, whether you failed or not, you're an amazing man. You're an amazing woman. Allowing failure and love to be connected and to not be distracted by, no, you're going to be the best in the world. I don't care if you're the best in the world. I value for who you are, not what you can do for me. This is Holding Your Own, a series from Therapist Uncensored that aims to deepen and broaden security when faced with challenging personalities. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey, everybody, welcome back. We are going to be jumping into the second episode of our series, Holding Your Own with Challenging Personalities. Our first episode, in case you missed it, was primarily about setting up the series, but also really went into what secure functioning couples look like, what are the conditions that promote security in a relationship. And we also touched on some of the neurobiology around what makes it so hard as things get tough And part of that, by the way, you know, messy relationships aren't necessarily unhealthy. And so we looked at that, but also kind of what makes it so hard? Why are we so compelled to hang on to relationships as they are difficult? Today, we're going to be talking about narcissism. And it's a really, really important topic, right? Because I think actually narcissistic traits are very predominant in our culture right now. And we're going to distinguish between having narcissistic traits all the way up to narcissistic personality disorder today. But the parts of narcissism that are actually promoted in our culture, and we're not just talking about a culture in the United States, in much of the world, we have gotten in the last 10 to 15 years promoting the dynamics of narcissism that on one level can make you feel secure and out there in the world, but also has this reverberating effect that can be really, really negative. So Hannah Gatsby is a comedian, a neuroatypical comedian who just made this joke about that the United States is the straight white narcissistic male of the world, <laughs> which uh, I think... <laughs> You're giving me a look. You don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was my association when you were talking about that the whole world, would, you know, struggle with narcissism. I was thinking, well, I think the United States has a special place for that. <laughs> well, and let's talk about why. We, there is so much in the United States that we have going well for us. I don't want to be negative on the United States. There's so many things that I think are really positive about the United States. But we do have an overemphasis, I think, on the idea of success an achievement in individualism. And when we focus on success, achievement, your own personal image and uh, achievements, it's a recipe for the individual self-centered focus. That's right. And so in today's episode, we're going to be primarily talking about there's three manifestations from a scientific standpoint of narcissism. It's all the same disorder underneath, but they look really, really different. So today, you know, we're going to go into the grandiose, the overt narcissist, the one that is the most common and most easy to identify, actually. One that you could think of as extroverted and charming, confident, well, egomaniac, you know, right. um, they externalize a lot, so they're never at fault. 
it's always somebody else's issue. But there's also a type of narcissism it's called vulnerable or covert narcissism. And actually, it really does still have the self-absorption and the entitlement of the grandiose narcissist, but has some really deep other experiences that make it manifest in a really different way. Right. And then the third aspect of that is when you can be a perfectly fine person with the injury of narcissism. But as it goes more extreme, then we're getting into what we call malignant narcissism and antisocial traits. And so we'll get into that later. But today, focusing on the overt narcissist, and I will overtly narcissistically mention one quick quick thing, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, (laughs) That we are a female-led indie podcast and that we are working really hard to do no ads. And the way that we support the show is through our Patreons. So thank you to everybody who continues to support us. If you would like to jump on and help us not do any ads, please go to patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored. You can join for as little as five bucks a month. You get all kinds of swag. So there's a quick little shout out for that. So, and I also want to say that as we're talking about difficult personalities and being in relation to one, we're going to be talking about how to look at ourselves and what gets us in these relationships and how to shift and move so we can deepen ourselves. Hold our own is the topic, but we're not only talking about romantic relationships. I want to be really clear. We have a relationship with bosses or siblings or, you know, so we're talking about the complexity of all relationships out there. The previous episode is a start of the series. That's where we really talk about what secure functioning looks like, even when it's messy, and some of the aspects that keep us in a relationship and make it so hard for us to leave as things get more dysfunctional and painful and uh, things like that. So you don't want to miss the episode previous to this. So first of all, can we just do an association like grandiose narcissist? So what do you think of listeners when you're out there, when you hear the word narcissist? Picture someone. Well, and one of the things we did do a shout out in the first episode that I think I want to remind listeners about is that we're not trying to be pejorative. And oftentimes we can throw these labels out to be very, very hurtful. He's such a narcissist. She's such a borderline. Um, that is a really painful dynamic to be throwing out, right? And we do it because it's easier to sort of project out our difficult feelings onto other people, which is something that we are prone to do as humans. Right. And nobody fits in a box. And even, you know, we're not only preoccupied, we're not only that. And so we want to be careful. I'm really glad that you're repeating this, Anne, about using labels defensively, because it's very easy to go, the bad's out there. I'm good, but my partner is such a narcissist. That kind of thinking is part of the systematic problem of narcissism. And so we're going to call that out a little bit and try to be more specific, more accurate as we're describing both sides of that. Right. So what did you think of when we said narcissism? Because the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of that is somebody that's very self-promoting, that the experience of being with them you are some way are going to find out about their achievements, whether it's through a subtle mention or a direct mention, you find out about their need to be seen and to experience themselves as bigger than life. I think a really good example of that that's not totally obvious is like, so let's say if I'm the person that's struggling with high narcissism and it's not that I don't ever do anything for you, but when I do do something for you, it's like I've made you the best meal you've ever had. In other words, it becomes more about me and what I've done in the meal instead of you and you enjoying the meal. And I think that's the biggest stuck point with narcissism as a trait. And everybody's going to recognize some of themselves in this. So because we all have some, and there's a healthy form of narcissism. We want to have a healthy feeling of being able to be out there in the world and produce and feel successful. We're not trying to negate that at all. The biggest telltale difficulty is the lack of relationality. It's not necessarily about you enjoying the dinner in that example. It's about you recognizing that I did that dinner for you, right? There's a big difference between I did this great dinner because I love you so much and I want you to feel that sense of love as opposed to I did this great dinner. I'm going to let you know because I need recognition that I'm a great person. And maybe it really was a very special dinner, <laughs> yeah. but the different, I like the, it's a subtle difference that you're making about grandiosity and that grandiosity isn't like, maybe I am a, actually a really good cook. That's one thing, but it's different if I'm a better person right? and grandiosity and therefore kind of this more destructive narcissism has more to do with a feeling that I'm just a better human being, not better at a particular task. 
Right. Because you can have lots of confidence in yourself as a cook. And we, we are in support of that. <laughs> we want high self-esteem. And that's how you know at times in a relationship with somebody that that characteristic is getting caught is when you feel the need to constantly affirm their capabilities and their specialness, right? Like if you're cooking for me, do I need to affirm you're the best cook ever? Or do I get to just appreciate that you're the best cook ever? Those are really different dynamics of appreciating you versus I need to affirm you so that you feel okay. And that's one dynamic of knowing that you're relating to somebody in this way is that you're giving up yourself a little each time in order to ensure that they have an experience of feeling bigger than life and more entitled and more special. Because when we're in the light of an actual narcissist, it feels so good. And we have more of a sense of belonging and our own self-esteem, you know, bumps up and we feel like we're extra special even. But the problem is, think of a lighthouse, is once that light isn't shining on you, then you feel that emptiness and that hollowness, and you'll often do whatever you need to do to try to get back in the light. And the light typically is something that reflects well on the person shining the light, on the grandiose narcissist. But at the beginning, I think let's talk about how easy it is to get in a relationship with somebody like this, because we're all prone to do that, right? We're all vulnerable to doing that. And part of that, I love how you're saying the light, is that in the beginning of a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship, that idealized self of the narcissist, and you come close, you know how when you first get in a relationship, let's just say say romantically, you kind of become one. Their, their strengths are your strengths, and you know, it's like this, and that's a that normal. Merger. Yeah. yeah, that merger is a normal part of a relationship. So when somebody has deep narcissistic traits, and they really believe themselves to be better than anybody, and they come in contact with you, guess what? You become better than anybody as well. By extension. By an extension. And so it is a really wonderful feeling. All of a sudden, you feel like you can accomplish anything. So if you live with some insecurities or some hopes, a narcissist can make you believe you can accomplish your best self and accomplish anything. And that feels wonderful. And that is also a natural part of falling in love. But to distinguish that is that somebody is over-idealizing you. And then when you start to not be that ideal self, a narcissist will try to fix and criticize you. Mm, that's a really, that's a big one. Yeah, rather than, no, I can support you in this. I want to support you. You want to be a great cook. I want to support you in that. It's like you said you want to be a great cook. You know, well, what's the matter? What are you not doing? You said you were going to be a great cook and you're not going to classes I bought for you. You don't want to really be a good cook. Do oh, you, that's fantastic. You feel the difference, right? Oh, it's just chilling. And now it's become about me because if you were going to be the best cook in our relationship, now I, as the narcissist in this example, I'm bigger than life because I'm a bigger life partner. So don't let me down. Not only do you need to reflect me, you also need to be as good as me like in that case, you know, here's what I'm thinking. Well, I did say that I really wanted to be a good cook and he or she bought me these classes and how kind of them to do that. And they're right. You know, like I do the classes, but I don't really do the exercises in between. And I'm, if you notice, like all of a sudden my sense of self is beginning to erode and I'm beginning to doubt myself and question and, and particularly affirm like they're right, they're right, they're right, they're right. And you can feel, as we talked about in the first episode, that one of the aspects of a secure relationship is protecting and attuning. So if that started happening, if I was attuned to you, I would be going, of course, you didn't attend all the classes. You, you know how busy you are? I mean, I want Aww, you to... <laughs> I feel better already. <laughs> I want you to have those classes. I gave it to you because it's something you want and you aspire for. But you're also busy as hell. So I get it. And if you can, let me support you to go to the class because now what I'm wanting to do is support you in that journey of what you want and where you can get caught. Like, I love how you put that is that you start to feel insecure because, well, they did give me the classes and they went out of their way. And now all of a sudden you're needing to reflect my greatness for giving you these classes. And now you feel inept because you're not doing what it is you said you were going to do. So Anne, let's play that out again for just a second. But since this is holding our own, right? Like how would that exact exchange sound with the narcissist and the classes, not the lovely, lovely uh, expression that you just gave. So if we go back to that example, like All right. how does that so, sound? So I just say to you, like, what the hell? You know, you said you wanted that. I gave them to you. You know how expensive those were? 
Obviously, you don't care about this. If I was holding my own, and as I build my own security, the biggest step is to differentiate myself from you. So you're disappointed that I haven't attended the classes. Am I disappointed that I haven't attended the classes? I'm not disappointed. I'm judgmental. Oh, that's true. You're angry. Right. Right. I'm looking down my nose at you. So part of the holding your own starts before the interaction. And that is that you feel the criticalness and you feel that it's actually judgment. So I'm going to stop and breathe and go, wait, I actually feel really good whether I attend those classes or not. Those are an opportunity, but whether I attend or not, I feel like a pretty damn good person, right? So now I'm going to differentiate from you and I'm going to come back and say, Sue, I'm really grateful that you bought me those classes. I know that you did that because you wanted me. I was saying how much I wanted and I do. I really, really do want to do that. But you know what? I've been busy and, I pre- and I'll go to those classes when I'm ready, when I'm really ready to go and maybe I can't go, but it was a gift. Thank you so much for giving it to me. Feels really different, doesn't it, guys? And we can imagine, though, a circumstance where the person might stay at them and keep the negativity going. And so we can begin to feel where it's more overtly abusive versus kind of covertly undermining you. So if I were to stay at you and criticize you more about like, well, the reason you're not going to the classes is because you can't keep up. Like, let's just face it. You just don't have the right stuff. The difficult part is that relationships don't start there. They start with a charming, inspiring, encouraging best self. And then this flips to the darker side where the criticalness and the judgment starts coming in. And it's insidious. Like this wouldn't be the first time in a relationship with a narcissist that I would have been feeling those subtle notches that could really erode my own sense of self. So just like Anne took a minute a moment ago and took a breath. So let's just describe for a second what's going on inside the person with the higher narcissism is that when she's just stood up to me, just by the nature of differentiating, now we have two people in the relationship and she's insisting that I see her as separate and she's insisting to exist outside of my purview, which is actually threatening for me. And you could feel a narcissist with more rigid traits will feel that separateness is threatening because Absolutely. it is actually one essential characteristics that you are underneath the current of narcissism is that there's not two people, that we are all there to support the one ego of the narcissist. So the separateness is what can feel extremely threatening to somebody who's developed narcissistic defense. And so it outrages. And That's it, right. It's like it's an affront to me. It it's provokes. A, that's right. It's an affront. You're trying to undermine me. That's kind of the tone. That's the feeling tone, which is then why what we see behaviorally is more aggression and more rage, because now I'm trying to push her back into her place of like, oh, no, 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 you are privileged to be with me. And you need to remember where you stand. And there's going to be consequences for you. You're going to lose my love and affection if you stay in this differentiated place. And all of that's unconscious, by the way, we're not saying these are necessarily that cruel and aggressive consciously necessarily, but we're really trying to bring out the unconscious. Which is one reason that as you noted, the breath, the taking of the moment, because what we're trying to do when we're trying to hold our own is to move from a reactionary place to an action place. So in a reactionary, if somebody's attacking you and criticizing you, a normal reaction would be to defend self. Or to join them, to join their aggression against yourself and to attack yourself with them. Right. And those could look different or the same. It could be, well, I really haven't had time, but wait, no, but I did go last week and I did and I told you, but I've been too busy. So it could be that, or it could be, oh my God, they're right. Like I always ask for things and then I just disregard them. And what a piece of crap I am. Like really internalizing the projected shame, the projected negative part in both of those are a reaction to feeling criticized and judged. So an important part of holding our own in this case is to not join the defense, not join the accusation. And it's really difficult because you're being called into it. There's lots of accusations that she just made. One is she's so great because she gave it to me. She's gone out of her way, et cetera. So one way of joining is we make the mistake in that dynamic and we project relationality. 
Wait, wait, that's actually really important. So say that again and see if you can explain a little more. Well, we could easily, especially if we are able through our own attachment to have more relationality. A narcissist, one of the things they're missing, especially further up on the continuum, right, is the inability to connect in a relational way. So your disappointment, instead of it actually being because you're disappointed for me, you know that I want to be a cook and I want to be a chef and you're trying to protect me and say, but maybe you're not going, you need to go. You're actually accusing me. It's non-relational. It's about you. But what I could do is project that you really care about me and start feeling bad because you really want this for me. And that is a mistake that we can make. So are we listening to the criticism? Are they actually caring for us? Yeah, this notion of projecting relationality is super important because if we come from a more relational place, we're going to assume that the other person is too, and we're going to put ourselves in that position. So if I'm being that upset with you and I'm a relational person, it must be because I'm hurt or I'm injured you see what I'm saying that like we put what it would mean if we were the ones doing it into the other person. But what that does is it it's basically literally like a denial of what they're actually doing, which somebody with high narcissism, especially grandiose narcissism is more transactional. So they do it in order to get something, whether it be the esteem or whatever it is. In this case, it may be that they gave me something. So I should be going and appreciating you. Thank you so much. Now I'm cooking better for you. Or just even that, like, if you become a good cook, it's because of me. Right. So now let's talk about three tells. And again, this isn't the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder, but if you're in a relationship, you're not going to probably go and have a professional evaluation. As a matter of fact, most of the time, narcissists don't show up in our (laughs) offices unless they're kind of pressed to do so because they're pretty happy with themselves. They've got the steam is pretty good. Their distress is actually not very hi, it feels kind of good to be in a narcissistic place, actually, or in a grandiose place. And it's really important to know that there's not that many diagnosed narcissistic personality disorders, because one of the elements to get an official diagnosis would be that you have a lot of distress, you have dysfunction in your relationship. And often a narcissist won't feel that dysfunction, they just feel the world around them is screwed up. That's right. And it's not that there's not dysfunction, it's that it's not inside of them. It's between them. And then if you're in a relationship where the person isn't holding their own, then the narcissist can have laid a long life devoid of any conflict because they're thinking things are going pretty good. So three tells, and this is kind of like in real life what it looks like. I'm going to touch on them very briefly, and then and you can help us go into some of them if you'd like to flush it out a little bit. But the three tells are that you're going to see that there's a real difficulty apologizing. There's a real difficulty in expressing any gratitude. And there's reasons, there's unconscious reasons for all of these. And they're also really bad at listening. Yeah, we call it a listening disorder, really. It's a listening disorder. It's an empathy disorder. Again, so let's start with apologies really fast. Why are apologies difficult? So an apology to say, I'm sorry, number one, as we've been saying, it involves that there's two people in the relationship and that I'm separate from you. And to say, I'm sorry, the biggest difficulty about narcissism is the the pushing away of their own vulnerability and their own shame. That's right. Because they're above reproach. Because if I've done something wrong, it means I'm all bad. And that is a really important thing to remember because someone that has developed narcissistic, rigid personality has had a history where to be vulnerable or to be imperfect was really a risk to them. And it threatened. So they either needed to be bigger than life because they were supported as a child that they are the best, which we know we're not. So there's an incongruence there or that we were not seen and really were raised by narcissistic type of relating where you couldn't have differentiation. And so we won't get into the complexity. No, but actually I do want to refer listeners. We've actually done two other episodes on narcissism where we go a lot more into that early wounding and what causes it. And I'm not remembering the episodes. They'll be in our show notes. They'll be in the show notes. So if you want to get more into this, be sure and do that. So the apology, that's right. We're above reproach. It's all or nothing. And so to apologize, you have to admit, A, that you've done wrong, and you have to admit some sense of one under. If I've done something wrong to you, I'm slightly under you. And that actually brings anxiety, fear. So there's actually a pushing out. It's not even a conscious, I can't do it. I can't feel that I've done something wrong and apologize. Right. That would overwhelm my nervous system. So it sounds more like, well, yeah, I'm yelling. It's because you did da, 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 da. 
Right. Or I'm right. sorry you feel that way. Right. And I love that what your example is, it gets turned around. The apologies. Well, I'm sorry I did that, but I had to do that because you did this thing. And so yeah. then what we're talking about is what you did that made you upset. So that's the apology. And then what about the gratitude? That's an interesting one. Ah, the gratitude is so important. People, the la- what I mean is the lack of gratitude. Uh, in, in People will say, I have a hard time expressing gratitude. Someone that has narcissistic traits will say, I just, I either don't need gifts or I, I just can't express gratitude. And it could seem like it's a humbling thing, but it actually isn't. Because what it is, it is an important part of our life to accept gratitude. We have to know that we need you. I need you. Well, and also that it is a message that you've impacted me. Yes, you've influenced me. You have had an impact. You've had an influence. I needed something, that's right, um, that you supplied versus this idea of narcissistic (laughs) supply. And typically, if you're a more narcissistic, grandiose narcissist, you're getting your narcissistic supplies without recognizing them or acknowledging them. That might be the car or the corner office or whatever it is. But again, remember, it's transactional. There's not the reciprocity that comes with a gift giving or acknowledgement giving. Because that's in a relationship. And it means that the other person existed and gave something. And so there's also, it it bumps up against the sense of entitlement and that I'm bigger than life. So of course I deserve that. Like, so it's hard to feel gratitude when you feel like, well, of course I got this because I've worked my ass off. Or like, I got the raise because I worked my ass off, not because, I deserved it. That's right. And then what about listening? Why is listening difficult? Related to just what we said, when you listen, that involves intimacy. And that means I have if to... you're actually listening, if you're taking in the other person's words and spirit and intent. Yes. And, and a narcissist tends to need attention. They need to feel a flow, like you said, a supply. So if I'm the narcissist and I'm trying to listen, I might actually, if I really tune into my body, experience a little bit of anxiety while you're talking because there's a loss of attention coming my direction. And unless I'm listening to you tell me something that I can really relate to and jump onto, it's really easy to get lost and tune out. I like that too, because I don't think that we've said it a lot in this episode, but what's underneath all of this big grandiosity, like that's again, the tell. I don't have to go around beating my chest and saying how awesome I am if I actually felt that awesome, right? Right. That is an adaptation. What's underneath is terror and shame and fear. It's very pushed down. So different kinds of narcissism, it's different, but this particular kind, they're not in touch with the shame, but you can see it behaviorally. The avoidance of it. The avoid, And also the rejection of it. So you right. end up feeling less than when you're around the narcissist. You just absolutely will. And that is them putting their less than into you. That's such a great way to say it. And one example you might hear of a narcissist saying is they're all idiots. Everyone else is an idiot. God, why is everybody idiot out there? Why am I the only one that can, why are we the only ones? Or another one is you're ridiculous. That's a real telltale sign. You're being ridiculous, right? Not that- What's a devaluation? Right. You're expressing something to me and I'm saying you're being ridiculous. You're being Mm -hmm. too sensitive. Or or the school is being ridiculous. I'm going to move my kid into the better school that has the such and such, such and such. So that's another parent version of that. Right. A sign of that also is like, you should not be part of the normal existence. So if there's long lines and a wait, there's a sense of uh, being done wrong, (laughs) right? So it's like, why should I have to wait? I should get the most special tickets and special seats. There's something because I'm so special. And like you said, there's an unconscious part of the shame that if I'm not being treated special, I might get in touch with that. And I can't, I want to go back to what you said earlier, that projected shame often comes out by projecting it through criticism and judgment. If I actually hold my own shame, I can't handle it. So I'm going to shame you. And that way I get released. It's like, I love to use the example. If I throw up, I feel much better (laughs) You know, if I'm nauseous. So if you think about a narcissist, like the idea that they may not be special and that they may have these feelings is overwhelming. So they have to quickly criticize and throw up and whew, they feel better. But there you are feeling criticized and judged. So let's use that then and go back into an example of holding our own. So one of the things we talked about listening being difficult, humility is really difficult. So let's say Anne comes home at the end of the day. And I say, just innocently, I say, Oh, I'm so exhausted. 
you think you're tired? Do you have any idea? You have any idea how hard I work today? Seriously? <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a laugh to just break that because it's so awful because it's actually so true. So just real quickly. So inside me, what's happening is I think I forget and I think I'm just sharing with my partner so a, a, an internal state. So in other words, it's all about me. When I'm saying I'm tired, it's all about me. It's not even about the other person. Because you had a really hard day. Because I really did have a you really were, hard day. But I would take it as standing in a narcissistic defense. I would take that as well, you might even have said I'm so tired because maybe I came home late. I'm taking it as um, that you're making an accusation towards me. That's right. Like, right. what do you want me to do? I didn't have time. To, right. You know, like I got home as soon as I can. You have no idea how hard today was. And I got home as soon as I can. Right. Look at what I, all I do for you, that kind of stuff. So again, remember the first example, how I can begin to deflate and get small and be like, oh my gosh, I can't, you know. Or the holding your own might sound like, babe, I know you work super hard, but I'm just telling you that I'm tired because the last three nights, remember, the kids have been awake and I've been up with the kids. I'm just saying physically I'm exhausted. I know that you work super hard and uh, I sure didn't mean to come across in any way that made you feel bad. Right. So in that example, you're allowing differentiation. You're seeing that I do work hard, but you're also expressing your experience. Yeah. But here's another nuance in that is in a more relational dynamic, I might be able to just say, look, it's not about you. I just said I'm tired, <laughs> you know, something simple. But when you have somebody that has more vulnerabilities and they're what they call narcissistic vulnerabilities that they, we know that they are highly sensitive and very thin skinned and take things very personally. So in that case, we're going to do something to actually hold them up so that it's just going to make it easier for you. So I add the, you do work really hard. You work harder than anybody I know. We add a little bit of that just to soothe that amygdala that is feeling threatened by the differentiation. And it's not a lot, like it doesn't have to be demeaning. It can just be like, oh, okay, I forget, you know, he's really sensitive about this or she's really sensitive about this. And so you give them a hand and right. hold their ego up a little bit as you're talking. But the difference is in holding our own is we're aware of their vulnerability. So we might give them a little bit of that, but we're not going to devalue or diminish ourselves in doing that. That's such a great example. And I think a, it's a great moment to talk about the continuum because there's a continuum of narcissistic defenses and you being able to hold your own and say, of course you work so hard. And as you were saying that, that could warm my system and it might help me come back into my relational self because don't assume that all narcissistic traits are so solidified down the continuum that they can't possibly come into their relational self when tuned into. So that is our point that we can, through our engagement, shift this dynamic where then if I'm not full down and I have this reflective capacity to kind of go, oh, of course, it might take my defense away and I might not as need it as much because I don't feel shamed. I don't feel like you're blaming me. Another way to do that is when you know that somebody that you're close to tends to have this defense, it's also a really good idea to prep them because what can happen is to somebody who is narcissistic, hey, can we talk is a way of sitting just alarm bells in their system because already you're suggesting you're upset with something. So their defenses start to stack. Can you feel that? So one of the ways to help in these kind of dynamics is to prep. Hey, I have something I really want to talk to you about. It's really not about you. I had a really hard day, but I really want to get your impression about it. I'm forewarning you and I'm setting the stage. And another thing I'm doing is I'm saying what I need. I really need your attention right now. When is a good time? And this is what I need from it. Because that's doing two things. Not only is it informing you, it's reminding me about what I need. So I don't get distracted if you get defensive. Oh, I think that is really, really great. And, you know, part of why that it's really hard for somebody that struggles with narcissism, and I like, we do want to hold the other person, hold them well in this, because again, remember that there's no distress. And so what we'd have to do weirdly is we have to kind of cause a little more distress. So in that case, like you start out lovely, you remind me you're, yourself what you need. You tell me to signal into you. You're signaling like, hey, this is about me, not about you. But let's say I'm just a real jerk and I am not empathic and I... You're further down the I'm continuum. I'm further down or I'm in a mode and I'm really pushing that. 
So in other words, like the more that you are a self and, you know, have a three dimensions, then the only way that I can relate to you is I'm either idealizing you and you're above me. And so I'm okay to be close to you because you bring me up or I'm going to devalue you and push away because if you're vulnerable, I don't want any part of that, especially if it looks bad on me. And so I'm going to push away. So that another really important dynamic about this. Can I jump in there for a second? Yeah. So you, uh, that lower part we haven't talked about. So as you're doing it, I want to mention. So if I'm, God, I really want to talk to you. I've had a really, really rough day and I'm pulling for you're empathy. You're so needy. Right. That's... What can happen? And it could be unconscious too. Like you might not even verbalize it, but what you might experience when I start to experience deep emotions that are hard is it could panic your nervous system. That's right. Because you have learned to, that being in your own negative emotions was not a safe thing. And that panic is unconscious. So it's a push down. So that may end up unconsciously or even consciously coming out as an eye roll. Or I could feel disgust. Like, right. oh God, you're just like complaining all the time. You know, some sort of, and you'll recognize if you're a long time listener, some of the blue side of this. It's not all about that, but like the, it's going to be dismissive. It's going to be avoidant of other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that devaluation. But I think the idealization is just as interesting, right? Because right. if you're doing something that makes me feel good or look good, or if I somehow can respect you and you're higher than me, then that's going to be a stable place for a narcissist. And we see this a lot in our sessions that if our clients can idealize us, then it's going to go well for a little while, even though we're aware that we're not working relationally. It settles them enough to be able to just work non-self-consciously. And one thing I've noticed is when you make a mistake in that position, they'll repair it themselves because it's not a relational mistake. And it's just like, it would be almost if I belched or something. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, give me it, an example. It, well, just like if I, if I go too relational and I say something like, oh, you noticed that I was late today. Or I noticed you didn't mention anything that I was, you know, 10 minutes late bringing you into the session. Oh, I didn't notice that. Exactly. It's a big deal. They, they will either, they'll either think that I'm self-flagellating. And, and again, that's the one down. Like, oh, I'm not even strong enough to just do it. Or that I'm so good that I'm right. going to call out my own mistakes. But just like you said, they'll blow it off. They're not going to see it as a relational move of like, hey, I was late. You get to have feelings about that and you get to tell me about that because I disrespected your time. It's kind of really that's the underlying message. Right. But for somebody who's in that more brittle place, they're not going to be able to use it. And they'll very quickly fix it for you one way or the other. Well, and I, well, I love what you're saying because now we're talking to therapists out there as well as anybody in relationship about my moving on could help you feel relief. Like, oh, you know, great. You didn't notice that I was late and I'm not going to say anything. But by you slowing down, what you're signaling, which is really important in the step of holding your own, is that you're okay acknowledging that you made a mistake and you're okay letting me have feelings. So what you're modeling for the relationship in the therapeutic hour with somebody who's brittle like this is, no, but wait, come on back. I did keep you waiting, which of course, depending on how far I am, I might be devaluing you. How dare you keep me waiting? Or if I'm in this idolized stage, no big deal, I was busy. But either way, I'm not even slowing down enough to have our feelings. And that's one thing that makes it difficult to be in a relationship with a narcissist is that part of slowing down. So calling into, but wait, 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 you likely have feelings about that and actually having somebody tune more in. And you might notice at the beginning of that relationship, that won't be tolerated. It takes a while to build trust to say, you know, I guess an, an older example is how is it for you that I haven't gone to those cooking classes? You know, like you seem really, really upset and angry. What is that about for you that I didn't go to those classes? Do you have feelings of disappointment? I'm calling you into your own feelings separate from me. That's right. And going back to holding our own, this is a really important part because the more that something like that happens, the more of a chance I have to work on my narcissism, but also it's going to add conflict in the relationship because- right. The whole issue is the person who with the higher grandiose narcissism is whistling along doing just fine. And so you want there to be more conflict in the relationship. I think I want to add to that because you brought up a good example a minute ago that fits for this because as you were even talking about the idealizing and the devaluing, somebody in relationship to a narcissist, when they start feeling criticized and they lost, you said, the light of the idealized, you could feel anxious of, oh, I don't want to lose it. So 
I feel on eggshells with you and I want to please you. So there's this process of wanting to please and please and please you in that process so that there isn't conflict, right? So there's an eggshell part of feeling. I don't want you to be disappointed because there's an underlying process. If somebody who has a narcissistic defense is disappointed in you, they might withdraw. They might reject. They might move away. They judge. So you lose connection and that can be anxiety producing. Yeah. And we covered in the session before about the neurochemicals that get going when I'm related you know, I'm connected from a relational standpoint and you're connected, say, from a more transactional standpoint that it works for you, but you're actually the most important person. I just am here. (laughs) That's one of the things that keeps us drawn in. And the more that we project our relationality into it, the more trouble, the longer we're going to stay, the longer we're with somebody that's this dismissing or this demeaning, it really takes a toll. Like it actually affects us. It makes our body sick. It's bad on our cardiovascular system on our stress response system because we're feeling all those small injuries whereas the other person is not and then our nervous system adjusts to that and we make excuses right you know they're misunderstood people misunderstand them he's really the greatest guy ever because the ideal of losing them is so scary it can be especially the longer you're in and your security starts to erode you can really start to believe that if you lose that relationship, there's no one there for you. And along the spectrum of narcissism, that might actually be directly expressed. You think you're going to find it this good? Well, go try. So just kind of as we're kind of coming around the corner here, one thought is that if you are really identifying with this and you're the person who's in the relationship, not identifying as the person with the struggling with narcissism, but the other person then it might not be the best idea to jump into couples counseling, for example. It actually, you might do better starting with individual therapy or deepening your individual therapy or deepening, like working on your friendships that are more relational and really enhancing your sense of self so that then you're going to be better at titrating how much relationality you're putting in because you do want to add conflict because you're trying to up the stakes for the person so they feel the pain so that they're willing to change. But if you do it abruptly or with a lot of ultimatums or whatever, that can prematurely create a crisis that you might not be prepared to do. And that then might pull you back right into that one down position. So that's a really that, good point. That's saying a lot, but the idea being that just to real slowly, like at the very first example, Anne did such a lovely job of like just taking a breath and it's like, I'm not trying to change you right now. I'm just trying to like hold on to myself. I love that statement because when you can repeat that to yourself, I want to hold on to myself and you can really have that as your own mantra. The way you engage can feel really different with all these different dynamics. And I love your point. I often can see somebody individually for a period of time and the partner is like, there's no way, there's no way he or she's going to ever come into therapy. There's no way, there's no way. And that's always a real sign to me, but it's not uncommon that that actually really does happen. And to one point is that, if somebody's pretty far down on the narcissistic continuum, they're not going to be provoked into therapy unless they really think there's a distress in the relationship and they're going to lose something. So to bring that prematurely and you're really not ready to stand up for yourself could actually just in, enhance the negative interaction. But if you get inside yourself and say, I need you to come, I am not happy. This is not working for me. And that partner can really hear that. It could actually by poking their sense of loss of relationship, depending on how far down they are on the continuum, they probably do value, they don't want to lose it. And that could be the motivation to actually get in there and more deeply look at oneself. And so we're going to remind everybody of sort of the three signs of hope, one of which is that you both are willing to notice the things you're doing to contribute to the problem, that you're both willing to be willing to change them. So it's not just, yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah, I yell at you sometimes, but it's because of such and such. It's more of, you know, I crap, I keep like saying really awful things to you. And I, I really want that to be different. I really don't want to do that. I see what it's causing you. And I can feel the pain of that. And then the third part is, because that's not even enough. It's like, I really wish that was different. I really wish I wasn't that way. <laughs> then the third part is like, okay, I'm going to actively engage. So in some ways, it's like what you're trying to do is put the discomfort instead of you feeling all the discomfort and your pie chart in your mind is filled with them and they're not even thinking of you and they're not uncomfortable. You very slowly begin to put the discomfort into them 
and let them figure out what they, how they're going to work on this. You don't necessarily drag them into therapy, but you're going to take care of yourself. And so they better keep up. <laughs> well, and one of the things that's so important in that process is that even somebody with significant narcissism wants a sense of other that can stand. So actually when you start finding your own sense of self in your own borders, it actually can have a reverberating effect where somebody can start seeing you in a more powerful light. And that powerful light actually gives more credibility to the both of you in the relationship. So it is the first step of holding your own. That's why we titled that. Because as you start to feel, instead of I have to get their support, I want to feel supported in myself. I want to feel some sense of attunement. So going back to those positive, secure signs, when you go, I really want this in my relationship and you're being told you're being silly, you can say, no, I really actually value this. I hear that you think that is silly, but no, for me, and if I was going to give two words in your journey to holding your own is to start sentences with for me, because it and immediately differentiates you he or she says something is being, well, for me, it isn't ridiculous. For me, this is how I feel. I've just drawn a distinction between the two of us. And that's an important marker. I love your point about as you hold your own, that it's going to help the other person see you, but also respect you. Yes. So you do not want to be the doormat. The doormats get walked on. They get devalued. You do not want to just disappear so that they're happy. So as you begin to emerge into your three dimensions, it really does bring a whole new level of hope because that was your half of what was, the problem was. So by you popping in the dimensions, and this begins to get us to point towards where we're going in this series as we wrap up today. But when you have somebody who's more interested in power over rather than power with, that moves us a little bit more into the antisocial. They recognize power moves, not relational moves. So as you, just even your great advice there about like, for me, like you're, you're already establishing yourself as equal. And, and that your needs there's are hope. important. There's hope that they can begin to see you in this more like, oh, you actually have something to offer them. And that, that again, that's where we want to change the dance. And then we don't know what's going to happen from there. It's not for sure. But we do know you're going to do better. And there's a chance that they're going to see you with a little bit more like, oh, there's someone there that I, this is kind of interesting to me. <laughs> right. And to have that uh, sense of other is so, so powerful. And so that's part of what can accentuate the hope is you finding your own sense of self and not losing yourself. And the more you find that, the more powerful it is. It's also important to remember what you value. Because as we started out in this podcast, one of the reasons why we're seeing an issue so much with the dynamics of narcissism is that we value some things and we might even get in a relationship because we value these certain things. And to question your own value, what is it that you actually really value? Is it somebody's achievement and charisma and power and production of material? Or is it actually we value connection? And we value deep trust that's between us, not trust that you're not going to have an affair on me. That's not trust. Trust is that you're going to see me and be sensitive. So when you get more clear, you mentioned going into individual therapy, get clear on what you value. And you might have to lose what it is you were attracted to. Like, because when you want to value that person, and even in the relationship with a narcissist, when they're pulling you for achievement, when they're pulling you for the compliments, you actually can see that more deeply and don't, don't buy into that because they believe that's their, their sense of value to you. So find what you actually value in them because we aren't all narcissistic. Even if you have narcissistic defenses, you might really value that he or she works really hard, but value that and don't get called into you're so great in the world. And an example would be, let's say they failed at a performance review you might be tempted to get pulled in, but your next review will be fine. They're stupid. And to push it over instead of, you know what, whether you failed or not, you're an amazing man. You're an amazing woman. Like allowing failure and love to be connected and to not be distracted by, no, you're going to be the best in the world. I don't care if you're the best in the world. I value for who you are, not what you can do for me. Well, you just nailed it, I think. That was fantastic. I really love how you just said that. 
Hey, and with that, I think that's a really strong ending. And remember that we're going to continue to do the deep dive. And next time we're going to be talking about covert narcissism, vulnerable narcissism, depressed narcissism. It's the same and it's different. It really looks different and it's very much more difficult to spot. So we look forward to sharing that with you. And if this has been valuable to you, please share this episode freely. Jump on and rank us and review us because that's how others find us in the world. And it's also how we have been able to bring on some really awesome guests. So it really is a direct way of helping us out. All right. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you around the bin. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 